I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, Meeting DFARS Controlled Unclassified Information Compliance Standards for Federal Contractors. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a few days. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical In Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSI Act to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Kevin Joyce from Quantarian Solutions. Mr. Joyce is a senior information technologist with more than 30 years of experience in networking and systems. He has planned, engineered, maintain and overseen upgrades of diversified network and IT systems for various organizations in the fields of healthcare, banking, and government defense. Kevin is well versed in the latest technologies and best practices for network management, administration, storage, and network security. He has also worked on teams conducting network assessments, security risk assessments, and risk management framework assessments for various uh, government agencies. Kevin was appointed as the uh, Quantarian Insider Threat Program Senior Official in 2016 and was a uh, key member of the CUI certification team. He holds a BS in Electrical Technology from SUNY IT in Utica and then MS in Telecommunications from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, I will now turn the presentation over to Mr. Joyce. Good afternoon, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve, I appreciate it. And welcome everyone, thank you for attending. What we're gonna go through today is the process that we followed here at Quantarian Solutions to meet the DFARS requirement for controlled unclassified information compliance. Uh, please feel free if you have questions to put them in the chat box. I'll try to get to them during the presentation. If not, I will get to them after. So here's our agenda for today. I will start off, we'll define what controlled unclassified information is, spend a little time talking about the background and then the program requirements. Go through our approach here at Quantarian of how we met the requirements. One of the major components of the compliance standards were to meet the controls with the NIST 800-171. So we'll go through the, a couple of those, talk about the implementation. Uh, the key components that we needed to develop were a security or a system security plan and a plan of action to meet the controls. We'll talk about the recording requirements from the DFARS clause and recommendations and go through the CUI registry and talk about subcontractors. So what is controlled unclassified information? The actual CUI reform was really a security reform brought on by the federal government. It was designed to make sure that all of the government agencies had uniform classification methods for documents. It identifies the information that needed safeguarding and the information that you needed to control the dissemination of. This does not apply to classified information, which is covered under NISPOM, and it also does not apply to information that is Freedom of Information Act. It was not designed to include that information. The laws that are in place for Freedom of Information will stay the same as what they were. So, the CUI standards set a framework for organizations to apply security requirements for information. They are supposed to ensure that authorized users are allowed access and unauthorized users do not have access. 
the impetus for controlled unclassified information actually started before this executive order. In a memo from George Bush after 9-11, it stated that there were major issues with the government agencies being able to share information because of the way it was classified. Information was classified different between different agencies and there were problems sharing that information because of who should have access within the agencies and between agencies. So in 2010, President Obama issued Executive Order 13556, we ordered all government agencies to follow uniform process for safeguarding unclassified but sensitive information. The Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, or DFARS, established guidelines that all government contractors must meet the minimum security standards by December 31st, 2017, or risk losing their Department of Defense contracts. The program requirements listed in Clause 252.204-7012 stated that we must meet the minimum security controls, provide adequate security. Now, adequate security is defined as meeting the security measures which match the consequences of the probability of loss, misuse, or unauthorized access to your information. Now, this includes contract propriety, proprietary information, excuse me, this is information that identifies the contractor directly or indirectly by the grouping of information that could be traced back to the contractor. This includes program descriptions, facility locations, PII or personally identifiable information, as well as trade secrets, commercial or financial information, and other commercially sensitive information. It's not customarily shared outside the company. It also applies to controlled technical information. For those of you familiar with the government procedures, this is distribution B through F information. Controlled technical information also includes information with military or space applications that are subject to controls on access use, reproduction, modification, performance display, release, disclosure, or dissemination. Part of the program requirements were that the contractors should implement the National Institute of Standard and Technology Special Publication 800-171 controls as soon as practical, no later than December 31st of 2017. I do want to note that there is a clause that says variance requests can be sent to the contracting officer and the DOD CIO makes a decision. We did not submit a variance request, so I don't know how easy it was to get those but most of the information you need can be found in your system security plan and your plan of action. So there's some additional requirements, cyber incident reporting, which we'll discuss later, controlled unclassified information marking, and the fact that the program does apply to all of your subcontractors. So Quantarian's approach. Here, we set up a team to work on the compliance effort. Team included IT people, cybersecurity, human resources, contracting, management, facilities, and our facility security officers. It was very important to be able to get everybody in a room and discuss the requirements because many of the control requirements dealt with each area of the company. We dealt with perimeter access. We dealt with system security. We dealt with media control. So you needed everybody on your team in the room to discuss these. You also needed people to review policies that are in their area of expertise. Back to the security controls in this 800-171 revision one, protecting controlled unclassified information and non-federal information in systems and organizations. This document was a subset of the security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations, as many of you are probably aware, is 800-53, which is used to apply to the, the government systems. Now, there was a supplement that came out in November of 2017, 800-171A, and this contained pro procedures for assessing the requirements in the 800-171 regulation. It gave you a little more detail, including the objectives and methods and additional guidance to meet those standards. 
This is a list of all the 800-171 control families. As you can see, it does cross all boundaries of your company. Access control, awareness and training, configuration management, identification and authorization, incident response, physical security, physical protection, risk assessment, security assessment, system and information integrity. The implementation. Here at Quantarian, we utilized our experience in RMF for risk management framework projects that we had participated in. Being familiar with those controls and the training that we had attended made it easier for us to be able to analyze the controls as we were looking at them and apply them to our systems. The big thing we did is we had one of our system administrators break down those control templates into separate spreadsheets for each family. That made it a little easier than rather than dealing through lines and lines for different families, be able to isolate a single family into one spreadsheet. And we were able to go through and analyze and document our progress. In those spreadsheets, it listed the controls, the 800-53 indicators, the control correlation identifiers or CCI definition numbers, provided implementation, excuse me, implementation guidance, the assessment procedures, whether it was implemented and where it was documented. Now, one of the things we did the first round of going through the documents was to highlight everything in red that we were not currently compatible with or not currently compliant with. Once those were documented, the next time we went through, we were able to easily find the items we needed to work on, and then we changed those back to black. And in the notes section of our spreadsheets, we were able to note the system security policy or the insider threat program plan in the exact section. So in the case of an assessment, it's very easy to go in and find exactly where you documented your compliance. That was the other thing that really helped us is we relied a lot on our insider threat program plan, which was published in 2016. A lot of the information we needed for our CUI compliance was included in the program plan. So control correlation identifiers or CCIs, these are standard identifiers and descriptions for specific controls or best practices. I have a couple examples here, CCI 002314, the information system monitors remote access methods, and this is in the AC control family. There's also 00823, the organization coordinates incident handling activities with contingency planning activities. And that's out of the, the IR family. Now these give you exact information on what you are evaluating within the control. So our assessment process, there's two, there's two steps. Your process, which is to gather information, identify weaknesses, prioritize mitigation decisions. So with this, you're going through your policies. You're looking at the details of your policies. You're identifying where information is missing and you're updating your policies. Now with the procedure, there's an examination where you're going into the policies in more detail and you're looking to develop the policies you don't have. Interviews are very important. You meet with the different uh, team members and with other departments to determine the information that you're missing. Do you have an onboard process document that includes authorization for the user to get the information they need? Do you have specific authorization for users that need administrative access? Do you authorize and approve a uh, virtual private network or VPN connectivity? These are things that are in the controls that you're procedures and processes across the board of the company need to be in place. And there's also test procedures. For example, do you have an incident response plan? Do you have an incident response test? These are things you want to make sure that you have in place and you need to document when you ran your tests. So the control requirements, there's two sets of requirements. There's the basic security requirements, which are your baseline configurations, your inventories, your security configuration settings. Inventories and asset management is a very big part 
of your control requirements because you need to know what is on your network in order to secure it. We have a separate guest network and we have a bring your own device policy, which limits people bringing in their devices and phones to that guest network, which has no connectivity to the inside network. Company controlled resources that are under our antivirus and our WSUS servers. Those are the ones that we allow on the internal wireless network. The other section of the control requirements are the derived security requirements. These include change management, access restrictions, least functionality, which means you provide the least functionality that people need to do their job. And the other really important security requirement is deny all or allow by exception. So in a firewall, when you configure the firewall, it comes in with no configuration whatsoever except for the very last statement, which is an implicit deny all, which means unless you explicitly allow it, everything is gonna be blocked. And that protects yourself from any information that's coming in and traffic that's coming into your network. So you need to know exactly where all of your configurations are and you're allowing exactly what you need on your network for people to do their jobs. So I'd like to go into a little example of one of our controls that we worked on. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, this may take a second. Okay, hopefully you can all see this now. Looks like it is sharing. Okay, so this is one of the fa control families, the awareness and training. And as you can see at the top, there's the basic security requirement. And this one happens to be AT-2, the security awareness and training. Gives you a description of what it does, provide basic security awareness training to IS users, information systems, including managers, senior executives, and contractors. The way the spreadsheet is set up, you'll notice the CCI right here, 1480, the control ID for this family, the 800-53 indicator, and the definition. The organization defines the frequency for providing refresher security awareness training to all information system users including managers, managers, executives, and contractors. And the farm, under the implementation guidance, this is usually what the DOD recommends. Now, as an organization, you need to make a decision if you're going to follow the same guidance or if you're going to vary from it. And if you do decide to vary from it, you should document why it, it should not apply directly to you. Obviously, with this one, the defined frequency is annually. We already did that as a company. so we were able to follow that recommendation. The assessment procedures give details on how an organization, if they're being inspected or assessed, how they're able to follow the requirement. Now with this one coming out of the, the DOD, it would have been compliant because they're covered by DOD 8570. Obviously we did not follow that. We have our own training program in place. And if you'll notice here under the implemented or implemented, yes, no, or undocumented, yes, we have it. And we detail exactly what our employees need to do, the fact that they review their annual training and they sign that they understand their responsibilities to protect information. The other thing we did is we made sure that we documented exactly where our policies are located. So this was the Insider Threat Program Plan Appendix K where we documented. It was very important that we noted exactly where the policies were located so that if we did get assessed, we were able to find that information right away. Okay. We're back to our slides now. So out of the 800-171 requirements, the two main items 
that you needed to develop were system security plan if you didn't already have them. And that includes how the requirements are currently met. We documented everything that we do as a system, including our physical security, our perimeter security. We added information about our bring your own device policy, mobile access, documented how our network's configured, our boundaries. The other thing we did is we created a plan of action until we were able to meet all the controls. The plan of action indicated how unimplemented requirements were going to be met. Now, these requirements, we were very strict about the way we created our plan of action. We made sure that they were linked directly to the CCIs and to the controls. So it was easier when we went back in to remediate the actions in the plan of action, we knew exactly where to find them and we had the requirements. So it made it a lot easier to remediate. Now, during our research, there's a number of policies that we determined that were needed. Now, not every organization needs these. It's based on your size and the work you do, but incident response, audit policy, acceptable use for users, uh, mobile device, physical security, records of ascension, if you handle personally identifiable information, PII, you need to have a policy in place of how you're going to protect that. And as most organizations should have, your business continuity, continuity of operations, disaster recovery plan, which should include documenting your backups and your recovery procedures. There is guidance to create a system security plan. This special publication 800-18R1 is a guide for developing security plans for federal information systems. It provides you a template to get started if you do not have one started already. So as I discussed previously, in the system security plan, there's a system operating area that breaks down your network, your system boundaries, where your locations are, what security requirements are met, as you go through, you'll document how your systems are set up, how your network's configured, your interconnections to other systems. Extremely important to be able to show how your systems connect to the internet and site-to-site -site VPNs and other connectivity so that if someone comes in behind you, you know exactly where those systems are configured and how they're linked. Links to policies, rather than recreating the wheel, we linked to the policies that already existed. We did not want to just create another incident response plan. We have an incident response policy, and in there we have a plan on how to respond to incidents. We also have an incident response test plan. So in our system security policy, we just pointed to those policies. We also tried to make sure that our system security plan aligned closely with the controls in the, the 800-171. For example, our audit policy, we attached to Appendix A, and we made sure that it was noted as the audit and accountability control family. The next requirement for the CUI compliance was incident reporting. The reporting requirement was that our government contractors must rapidly report cyber incidents within 72 hours. All cyber incidents, including ones that result in significant loss of data, system availability, anything that impacts a large number of victims, unauthorized access to or malicious software that is found on critical IT systems, anything that affects critical infrastructure or core government functions, impact to national security, economic security, or public health and safety. Contract subcontractors some contractors are required to report incidents directly to DOD at dibnet.dod.mil. And if you go to that site, the Defense Industrial Base Cyber Incident Reporting link is shown below. This is where you actually submit your report. You need to make sure you have your information before you try to create your report. You need the details of the incident. You need your company information, point of contact your contract information, your Dun & Bradstreet number. In your incident response plan, all of this information should be detailed. You should have a form that you fill in the information which should match what they're looking for. So it makes it easier. 
You also need to make sure that forensically you have all of your data saved and that you're able to provide the information if the government needs to come in and do a forensic analysis. So you want to make sure you preserve the evidence. Okay. The next section is the CUI registry at archives.gov. This is an online repository for information guidance policy and the requirements for handling controlled and classified information. Identifies the approved CUI categories and subcategories. This is where it tells you how to actually classify the information. It's also very important that information is properly marked. There's an entire handbook called the CUI Marking Handbook, archives.gov. Define standardized markings. Details mandatory and operation or optional markings and subcategories. The Department of Defense is responsible for assigning the markings, and these you can find online. And as you've noticed through the presentation, I've included references in the last two slides, so you don't have to dig and try to find all the information. You can go to the references and find the latest information and updates if there are any. One of the other clauses in the DFARS recommendations were to notify prime contractors when submitting a variance request or provide an incident response number to prime contractors when reporting a cyber incidents. So your subcontractors are responsible to you for providing that information if they have an incident or if they're requesting a variance. Okay. So that's all I have. Uh, I just wanted to point out that there is a CUI forum on the SISIAC website. We're hoping that everybody will come in and share your lessons learned and be able to share information to help those who have not yet met the compliance or information that you found. I think we have some time for questions. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, there was a... Uh... It was a good overview, uh, you know, very, very good, thorough overview of the process, and we appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, give us a rundown on that. So, uh, as Kevin said, that was kind of the, you know, the lessons learned that uh, the Quantarian Solutions, um, uh, you know, that that was their experience in in the uh, in the process of going through the through the CUI uh, compliance uh, activity. And uh, so, uh, you know, if anybody else, uh, you know, Kevin pointed out the forum, if any, anybody else wants to provide and submit some additional information, uh, you know, happy to, you know, if you've got some, what, what you think were, were good approaches, uh, uh, you know, best practices, you know, we, we'd be happy to hear about them and share them with the community. And if other folks have questions, they're still struggling with things, uh, we're, we're also happy to try to answer the questions uh, that you might have. So we, we do we do have some time. So we'll uh, we'll take a take a look at our uh, questions that came in through our chat forum and see what uh, see what we have here. So okay. Um, well, I'm looking right here at Silvio. Uh, he's absolutely correct. System security plan, uh, system activity report. Uh, there are the the POAM is more for the government side. We decided to do a plan of action. We don't really include the milestones, other than it's a working list that we're using to that we use to cross off uh, and keep track of the items that were outstanding. And RuPaul submit the security package to the government. I, the first thing I should have said is, no matter what I say, make sure you checked with your contract officer. Your contract officer in coordination with your government contracts or contacts will actually determine any requirements that they have in addition to what you're reading in the standards. So we did not submit a package to the government. We have to have everything in place. And our DSS representative, when they inspect us for our security inspection, will be looking at all of our uh, all of our plants. So check with your contract officer and see if there's a requirement to submit to the government. So Kevin, that, that question actually popped in right as you were, you were talking about the uh, incident reporting. Um, 
So I'm not sure if that question was was directly related to that. You were you were on slide 22, the incident reporting, when that question popped up, and you did answer it on the. Uh, if the it is slide. related to the to the IR, you did answer it on on the next slide. So you know if there's some other issue or question, uh, but but that is you know that that's the. Uh, uh, I, that's the slide there where you, uh, you know, if you do have some kind of a, an incident, um, you know, th those are the places where you, you know, you'd need to submit the information on that. So. Okay. All right. How does this uh, pertain to hiring foreign nationals? That is totally up to your organization and the government contract. You need to look at the terms of the contract. I don't think controlled on inf unclassified information really has anything to do with that other than dissemination, but you really need to look to your contract officer to get clarification from the government. Yes, Andrew, we do use VLANs and separate networks. We use a number of VLANs and that is how we control access between our different networks. Uh, we also use our active directory permissions to control access to information. Google, Google Cloud good enough? I'm not familiar with Google, Google Cloud, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, as somebody pointed out below, uh, there are FedRAMP accredited sites. You have to be very careful and really analyze the FedRAMP uh, requirements. Um, CUI is covered, or cloud is covered under CUI, uh, but it really depends on the cloud site. I know Amazon Web Service has a number of FedRAMP and uh, control classifications that they follow. That's a good question, Jan. Um, I don't know. I'd have to get our marketing people and our uh, administration people to find out how much we spent. Um, I know because that we've done RMF work, we were a little more familiar with it. So it was more a matter of getting together and analyzing our policies. So that would have to be a, a company individual decision. Uh, but a lot of the things that we did were things that we should have been doing anyway and updating our policies that were already in place. Most so of the... Kevin, it, it, Kevin, in general, did I mean, did you did you find uh, you know the the process w worthwhile? I, I you know I you think you said they were things we should have been doing. So you know, did it you know kind of kind of force force the issue? I mean, if if other if other folks hadn't been doing it, is it you know did you did you actually find value in in having to do this process? Oh, it was it was very valuable. It was it's industry best practices and a little more in depth than most companies would go to. And it, it kind of forced you to look at the things that you may not have looked at. You know, is your incident response plan up to date? Do you have a test plan? Do you test that? And that's the way that a lot of the controls work. You need to have a plan. Have you reviewed the plan? Do you review it annually or at some controlled uh, point? Do you test the plan? So a lot of these things that, you know, as organizations, as IT security professionals, we should be doing anyway, but we get caught up in the day-to-day -day in the projects and we don't always take the time to do those things. So it's more of a checklist to be able to go through and make sure that you're doing things the right way. Uh, let's see, Charlotte, outside of the DOD, if the government agency has not defined CUI, we are taking steps to define CUI within our organization. That's a very good point. Um, that's a important part you've got to identify the information you have to protect and from a network standpoint you need to be able to protect your empire entire network in order to protect that sensitive information yes neil uh controlled unclassified information let me see if i could scroll back up here and get to the slides it's not letting me so controlled unclassified information includes controlled technical information, technical information with military or space application that is subject to controls on the access, use, reproduction, modification, performance, display, release, disclosure, or dissemination. But it also includes proprietary information that identifies the contractor, 
including program descriptions, facility locations, personally identifiable information or PII, which is especially important with the HIPAA laws and also with uh, some of your other regular regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley. I didn't sp speak about it a lot, but as a company, you really need to protect your employee information because that is one of the things that will cause trouble if that information gets uh, released. Things like people's social security numbers, things that a hacker would want and identity thieves. So any kind of personally identifiable information, including uh, addresses and you know cell phone numbers, um, any of their medical information, all your medical forms that people fill out during their benefits enrollment, that information has to be protected, not only from outsiders, but it should be protected within your company as well. I'm trying to read the rest of your question here. I hope that answered what you were asking, Neil. What, as far as policy that prevents the use of CUI on non-government, this is actually a uh, policy. We are working on finalizing our policy, but at Quantarian, our policy is that only information, only information on company owned computers is allowed, uh, CUI on company owned computers. And the main reason for that is with a company owned computer, we are allowed to dictate the antivirus. We push updates. We ensure that there's no viruses and make sure that when you connect to the network that you get updates and you're scanned. Uh, on personal computers, there's no control over what information is on there and can be accessed from the outside. Uh, we do not, some companies have a network access control system that allows outside computers to come in and be tested with a network access control system it will test whether you have updated antivirus, whether you have recent patches. Uh, it's critical for all of us, as we all know, to make sure our systems are patched and our antivirus is up to date. I know there's some people out there who say that antivirus is old, you don't need to use it anymore, it doesn't help. But it does help, primarily because hackers go for the low-hanging fruit. They want to detect the easiest information they can get to. And if there's a vulnerability that's been around for five or 10 years, that's easy. Everybody knows how to exploit that. So if you don't take the time to patch the older, uh, the older issues, then you're going to be just as vulnerable as, as a new zero day attack coming out. So Kevin, okay. Kevin, I think you also, I think you also mentioned that the, uh, regarding you kind of bring your own devices that uh, Quantarian set up a separate network for personal devices that connect to, which are separate from the uh, company, uh, the corporate network. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, we do. We have a guest network that, you know, personal devices, cell phones and uh, tablets and things that can connect to just internet access, but it does not have access to the inside. Uh, going back to the list here, Charlotte. Yes, we do. Uh, conduct internal external penetration tests. We do those in house. We have people on staff that can do that work for us. Okay. Kevin, there was another, there was an, Kevin, there was another question about, um, you know, prime, a prime uh, dealing with subcontractors. If, if different primes, uh, you know, different primes are using the same subcontractor. Um, there was a question about, you know, when the primes flow down, flow down their CUI requirements to the, to the subs, uh, could it be possible for the subs to receive conf conflicting guidance from those, uh, from those primes? Well, I guess it would be possible. What I would do is go through your contracting officer and make sure that your contract details exactly what you're looking for from your subcontractors. Uh, we're all following the same uh, requirements. We're all following the 800-171. So we won't, we shouldn't have those conflicts. They should be able to, um, you know, follow the same requirements and make sure that the, your subcontractors are 
you know, on the same page as you. But like I said, you know, these are things that have to be worked out through this uh, contract officer and make sure that, you know, it's clearly spelled out what your expectations are from your subcontractors. Now, now, now with the, uh, you know, with the uh, regulation, though, wasn't wasn't there some sections that were kind of open, open to interpretation where, you know, where that could lead to, you know, one prime, you know, taking one path, uh, you know, one one way of handling handling it, and the, uh, you know, another prime may make a different decision. So, so I think, you know, so I think you could end up with a, um, you know, like I said, one prime asking for something, uh, and another prime asking for something else. So, I, I, I think you, I think you could see some, I think you could see some variations there. So, I think you, you know, I think you, you know, you may have to work those issues if they if they do arise but I, I do think that is a possible uh, uh you know viable possibility yes it absolutely is uh you really should like i said go through your contracting officer and make sure that you're understanding what they're asking for uh from your prime contractor uh going back to the next question yes if you do meet all the requirements of the 853 you will meet the CUI requirements because the CUI requirements are a subset of the 800-53. Silvio, plenty of 800-171 controls that address supply chain management visitors. Okay, well, thank you for that information, yes. As for Google Cloud, uh, if you guys can see what Silvio pointed out, the cloud service providers covers controls, security zones, and most importantly, incident response data destruction. Okay, Bruce. Okay, as a subcontractor, how far does requirements extend down our supply chain? Meaning does our supply chain need to comply with these requirements as well? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, there was a presentation in the fall that talked about uh, the exact requirements of the supply chain. Um, everyone that is working for you should provide information. Now, I'm not an expert on supply chain. I would definitely talk to your contracting and make sure that, you know, your subcontractors are, you know, following the rules that you set forth. Yeah, Kevin, I did. I was at a conference last fall, and and one of the uh, one of the sessions uh, was dealing kind of you know with manufacturing technology, and uh, you know I think the I think part of that you know part of that discussion during that conference was um, you know the manufacturers you know the suppliers having to do you know having to meet these CUI requirements as well. So. Um, you know, I, I think that is, I think that is something, you know, once again, it's, they're like a subcontractor and, you know, they, they, I think will, will have to conform, you know, with these requirements as well. So. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Well, you know, Chandler points out PAI is only CUI when it's government employees. That's, not true. Personally identifiable information applies to everybody in your company. Um, as a company, whether we have government contracts or not, we need to protect our, our employees' information. Uh, it's the same thing at a hospital, at a bank. Uh, you need to protect your employees' information from access from outsiders. Do we allow company email on BYOD? Yes, we do. Uh, we protect our information here, but... Um, we do not allow classified emails and it's not government email. It's internal company information. Uh, Jan, do you anticipate the government will want to do a compliance audit prior to your order a contract in the future? Uh, they can, I don't know if they will. Um, the documentation that I read and all my research said that there's nothing that says they will do an audit. Uh, but you want to make sure that you have everything in place in the event that they do. I, I do see your response, Chandler. I'm thinking more not from a government contractor. I'm just thinking from a company. So um, 
any PII within your organization should be protected, should have additional uh, protections in place. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think re you know, in in that regard, I I I think most companies want to you know protect their employees' information. I, you know, the companies want to protect their pro 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 proprietary information. So, um, you know, I, I I think that's only I think that's only common sense that you know we we'd want to protect our our own personal uh, data as well. Right. But uh, we I just, think uh, I. We, I think what people are pointing out is the actual definition of PII is only federal government employees, but uh, it's just for company protection. It doesn't have to be included in your CUI plan, but it's just best practices for your company to protect all of that information on your employees. Uh, James, no, we do not use a third party penetration cost, uh, company. We have uh, cybersecurity analysts on site who are able to do the work for us. Okay, Barry, sub supply and components that are available in commercial products. Does the engineering the documentation fall under DFARS? As I said, I read the definition earlier of the technical information. Um, mainly that has to do with military space applications, subjects controls, um, disclosure or dissemination, but also the contract proprietary information that includes identifiable information, trade secrets, commercial or financial information, or commercially sensitive information that's not customly shared outside of the company. So commercial information, I do not believe would fall under this, the DFARS requirements. So as far as Andrew's question, do we allow VPN access to your CUI storage? Yes, we do, because we use dual factor authentication. So they would authenticate just like they normally would, plus they would use dual factor. Okay, Joel, the DOD contracts are not specifying what data is CUI. We are taking the approach that all data generated, all data generated or received is CUI data. That's very good. I, I think we defined it as the data that would be uh, our sensitive data or data that was under the distribution B through F that we handle for the government. Um, we are not protecting, you know, presentations like this that are, you know, open source. Um, but we looked at our data and things that were under those distribution lists or things that were uh, PII, th that's the data that we are protecting. Yeah, so the, so the only one you didn't have listed there under, that, uh, under the CTI category, the, um, so distribution A is basically full and open. So when, when it's uh, of that nature, that's something that we're not, you know, we're not concerned about. Correct. Okay, I'm reading through Chantel's post. All right, thank you for that. That's very good in response to Jan's question. Okay, Andrew, how do we enforce guest access for BYOD? We actually do do MAC authentication. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, but as a smaller company, we are able to do that, and we do on both guest network and the internal network. We enforce MAC authentication. Uh, Sylvia, I'm not sure what you were asking. A tool other than Exacta by Telos. Uh, we are not using it. Yeah, well, we are not using Exacta for our CUI. Um, I think if you have familiarity with it, it's very expensive, uh, and it's more designed for the government you know, RMF process, um, something somebody could certainly look at. I don't know if they will be coming out with a CUI module in the future. Uh, I think for most small organizations, it's going to be priced out of a, the range that they'd be able to use for a compliance program. One other thing I failed to mention is one of the things that we did here internally is we implemented a web security gateway, which really helped with a lot of our monitoring and blocking of malware and spyware and uh, viruses. So 
that's another area to look at for a semi-reasonable fee. You can have a device that's automatically updated that you can program and then you can do reporting and gather information and block exactly what you want to protect your users. Chandler, the registry says PII is only CUI when federal government employees. Uh, trying to understand. I think I, I think that I think there's been some internal dialogue there on on the chat line. I think you can I think you can go down. Uh, I think you go down okay. farther. Uh, uh, there's a question on the following up on company email on the the BYOD. Uh, do you prohibit discussion of CUI electronically? Uh, any other controls other than the policy itself? Uh, no, we do not. It's all policy based. Um, our web security gateway may allow us to block certain traffic, but we have not configured that as of yet. Uh, then Andrew, last question. VPN access to CUI, is it an additional step for your users to get to the CUI data or is it the same process? No, it is an additional step. Uh, when we need to access our CUI. If you're remote, you're going to log into the VPN and we allow users the same access as they would if they were sitting at their desk. Um, they use their same domain credentials to be able to access the network. But we have dual factor authentication to be able to access the CUI. So whether you're here or whether you're remote, once you've authenticated the to the VPN, all your traffic is encrypted, you still need to do the dual factor. Um, so you have your username and then your your code that expires every minute. I don't see any more questions, Steve. Oh, Mark just squeezed one in. Uh, Under oh, the wire there. <laughs> paste the link, but search. Okay, thank you for that information, Mark. Thank you, Harry. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. Well, Kevin, I think we're uh, we're coming right, you know, right uh, winding down to the end of our time here today. Um, uh, I want to I want to thank you, Kevin, once again for giving the presentation and fielding the uh, the questions. We had um, you know a lively uh, lively session today with our attendees. A lot of a lot of questions. So thank you for trying to uh, field those and answer those. Appreciate that. Um, once again, you know, just just want to you know remind folks that we do have the tech forum. So if something, um, you know, if a you know question pops into your head, uh, you know, somewhere somewhere after this uh, webinar ends, um, you know, you can always you know you you can always come back to the site and uh, post your question on the uh, on our forum uh, forum site there, and we will uh, we will do our best to get back and try to give you an answer and point you in the right direction. So.